Ladies and gentlemen, I am truly delighted to welcome you to this event, the second in the Hassan Imam lecture series. If I may begin by saying a few words in the series, it is being held by the Imam family in the name of our late whose picture you can see in the left of the room along with that of our mother. As an ambassador, Mr. Hassan Imam was deeply professionally and personally in the great issues of his time. This is why we are trying to honor his memory by holding a series of high quality lectures on topics which are of great significance today. And among these topics, nothing could be more burning concern than that of climate change. Which is why we are also so pleased to be able to present today a lecture by someone who is undoubtedly one of the world's leading authorities on the subject, Dr. Salimul Haq. Dr. Salimul Haq has attended all the UN conferences which have been held over the last decade or so to try and tackle the grave exposed by climate change. In particular, he was present at the COP21 conference held in Paris only last month, in December 2015. However, the icing on the cake for us today is that not only was Dr. Salim Haq present, but he played a powerful behind-the-scenes role in helping to bring about some of the critical decisions that have led commentators to call this conference a major turning point in humanity's attempts to tackle this problem. Without further ado, therefore, I would like to call on Dr. Salim ul -Haq to present to us the inside story of the COP21 conference and of his participation in it. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Salatin Imam and Salat Imam, better known to me as Tupai and Manama. For inviting me to this uh, series, and I'd also like to say a few words of uh, uh, remembrance and tribute to the late uh, Ambassador Hassan Imam, who is also regarded as an uncle to me. I remember very fond memories uh, from Karachi a few decades ago when we were all young, uh, of being with him, spending time with him. So it's a great honor. Uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, do three things. Start with a little bit of science, and then uh, a bit more of the global politics around the issue of climate change. And then I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, the story is the story of what the vulnerable countries have done in the climate change framework. And within that, uh, a, a very small part that I had the privilege of playing so I have uh, somewhat of an insider's view of what happened, which I will share with you. So the bit of the science is that climate change is happening. The atmosphere is warming due to the emissions of greenhouse gases that we 
emit from burning coal, burning oil, burning natural gas, from methane, from a variety of sources, these gases have been we put into the atmosphere for the last uh, almost two centuries since the Industrial Revolution, and they soak up the sun's energy and heat up the atmosphere. This is science, this is physics, there is no question about this phenomenon. What is new is that if we continue to do this, and the scientific community made this very, very clear through something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a global uh, UN developed uh, body of scientists who are charged with assessing the level of science, the knowledge base, and of uh, providing guidance to governments on what needs to be done. And the IPCC produced its first report in 1990 which essentially said what I just said, that the emissions of greenhouse gases continue to rise. If they continue to rise, then we are headed on a path over the next century of temperatures rising to the level of 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 degrees, depending on which global circulation model uh, you want to pick. The models all say it's going to go up. They just say by different amounts, so you have a fan of uh, potential temperature rises, anything from 4 to 8 degrees. And in fact, over the last 20 years, we have been uh, moving along the higher end of that fan. So the actuality of temperature rise, we have risen by one degree already of uh, temperature, uh, has been on the upper end of that fan. And so the warning from the climate change community was, unless we do something about this, we're headed for uh, potentially catastrophic changes of uh, atmospheric temperatures, which may not seem a lot, but these are significant temperature rises uh, of the order that we have seen in geological time scales, when we have ice ages and these are the kinds of temperature differences of a few degrees centigrade that have caused either an ice age or an interim ice age. So that was the warning from the scientific community. In response to the warning from the scientific community, the global uh, poli political community, policy making community uh, responded. And it's an interesting um, reflection of that time uh, to think of who were some of the key politicians who responded to. One of them was the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher, who is a conservative, was a conservative. Um, and conservatives in general are not really great believers in climate change. But she understood it, and one of the reasons why, in my view, was that she had studied chemistry at the university. She was a graduate of chemistry. She understood the science. She didn't question the science. She understood and she said, this is important. We need to do something. And the UK were one of the countries that initiated the discussions and negotiations that led to the UN Climate Convention on Climate Change and Science in 1992 in Rio. Uh, just as an aside, one of the other leaders at that time was critical, uh, was the then Environment Minister of Germany, who is now the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, who happened in her previous to political life to be a physics professor in East Germany, and again, understood the science, and as a politician, said we must do something about that. Fortunately, the politicians nowadays tend to not have a science background, and hence you get more of the skeptics in politics than you do people who understand science and can relate to it. But that's an aside. So what happened was we have the Framework Convention on Climate Change, agreed in 1992, all countries came together, we agreed to tackle this problem, it's a global problem, unless we do it together, uh, we're not going to solve it, no country alone can do it. And so the logic behind having a global treaty had a negotiation, we had a treaty, we agreed the treaty. Nobody disagreed. The United States was one of the first countries to actually ratify the UN Framework Convention in 1992. Two things about the convention. Firstly, it says that everybody needs to take action. There's a very famous phrase in the UNFCC called CBER. It's common but differentiated responsibility, which means common meaning all countries, all nearly 200 countries that are signed up to the uh, need to take action, agree to take action. But, there's a but there, but differentiated in the sense that the rich countries bear a greater responsibility. And they accepted that. They are in the UN Framework Convention, they are listed in an annex, it's called Annex 1. They are listed by name, and they agreed to be listed by name. They accepted that because they were the ones who benefited economically from the Industrial Revolution and the burning of fossil fuels over the last 150 years, they bore a greater degree of responsibility, and they accepted that. They said, we will take more action. 
than the rest of the world as a developing country. So we, we bifurcated the world into <coughs> Annex 1, rich countries, non-Annex 1, everybody else. And in the UN Framework Convention, this is the two groupings of countries, big groupings, that negotiate, uh, not always against each other, but the two big groups. Within these, there are then subgroups, and I'll talk about a few of the subgroups, particularly in the uh, developing country side, the non annex one side. So the non annex one countries have a, a collective negotiating block. It's called the Group of G77 and China. It started a long time ago when there were 77 countries. It's now double that almost, with uh, 136 countries. And that is a political group. We each year they elect a chair, and they, have, they meet, and they have um, <coughs> discussions, and they negotiate as a block, uh, as, a, as a negotiating block, by and large. They don't always agree on everything, but they try and, and negotiate as a group. Within this group of G77 in China, there are subgroups. There are quite a few subgroups, but the significant ones from the point of view of the story I'm going to tell you later are the most vulnerable countries groups, and there are three of them. Three distinct groups of overlaps. The first group are the poorest countries in the world. There are about 50 uh, of them, most of them in sub Saharan Africa, uh, some in Asia, including Bangladesh. These are called the least developed countries, LDCs. Um, it's a historic group that has been identified. It comes actually from the trade, UNCTAD and, and uh, WTO uh, negotiations when these poorest countries were given duty free access to the trade. They formed a group, and they, in the UNFCC, the same group are also vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, so they, they have a group that they negotiate as. The other two vulnerable country groups are the small island developing states. These are countries like um, Fiji, Samoa, and other Pacific islands, Maldives in the Indian Ocean, uh, Haiti, and some of the Caribbean islands in the Caribbean. And they're roughly about 45 or 46. Uh, small island developing states, and they negotiate as a block. Their negotiating block is called the Alliance of Small Island States, AOC for short. And then the third group of vulnerable countries are the countries in Africa. This is a geographic and a political group. So every country in Africa belongs to the Africa group, um, and they negotiate as a group. And that's another 56 countries in Africa. So if you take these three groups into account, there are overlaps, obviously. A lot of the African countries are LDCs, but they're also in the Africa group. Some small islands are both LDC and Africa. Uh, if you take the overlaps into account, there are roughly 100 countries. 100 countries is a significant number because in the in the international negotiations in, in the UNFCC, there's a 195 countries. And the G77 in China has 136 countries. So the three, nego the three vulnerable country groups together, 100 countries, is a majority of the whole UNFCC, out of 195, 100 is more than 50 percent, and there are super majority, two thirds, more than two thirds, within the G77 in China, 100 countries out of 136. But in the negotiations, their voices are nowhere near reflective of that mass of numbers that they have. In the negotiations, they hardly matter. Their voices don't matter. They don't. They're not listened to. And so, one of the things that over the years I've been doing is I work very closely with the least developed countries group and then increasingly with the other two groups is to get the vulnerable countries to get together and voice their concerns together and have strength in unity and use that strength to uh, get their views across and to persuade other groups uh, to agree to what they want. And in the negotiations, as I said, with the negotiators, we've been working very closely. I work as an advisor to the group of uh, least developed countries which Bangladesh is one, Bangladesh is a very prominent member. At one point, Bangladesh shared the group. The current chair is Angola. Uh, but the Bangladeshi negotiators are part of the senior negotiating group of the least developed countries. And over the years, the least developed countries have become much, much more effective as a group. They're very, at the moment, I'd say a very, uh, very effective group of negotiators. But negotiations are not everything. Negotiators are mid-level bureaucrats, maybe even senior bureaucrats. They are not political masters. So, Final decisions at a very high level have to be done by politicians in the end. And the negotiators can only do so much. And so this is where I'm going to start my story. The story begins in 2009, um, about six to eight months before 
a major planning summit was going to be held for the 15 conference of parties in Copenhagen in December of that year. Um, and we were all expecting in Copenhagen to have a new breakthrough treaty that would replace the previous Kyoto Protocol that had been agreed in Kyoto and have a new uh, dimension or a new direction for tackling climate change with all countries coming together. But we failed uh, in Copenhagen. We failed to do this. And I will tell you the story of what happened there and then what happened later. So I begin with the story of failure and I'll end with the story of what I feel is success. So the failure in Copenhagen was the problem. And I'll, I'll tell you the story now <coughs> from the perspective that I've been involved in it with the group of countries that I've described. So, as I mentioned at, the, at, the, at that point in time, before Copenhagen, uh, some months before Copenhagen, at the negotiator level, the three groups of our countries, we had come together, we had agreed a common position on the long-term temperature. And so, as I said, the temperature matters to us. Uh, in the Framework Convention on the temperature, what it says is that we must avoid dangerous climate change. And, but it doesn't define what is the threshold for dangerous. And the scientific community was asked this question and they threw it back to the politicians and said, dangerous is in the eye of the beholder. Depends, dangerous for whom? For what? For a particular species of plant or animal or for fish or for humans and which humans? This is something you politicians have to decide. We scientists cannot decide. And so there was a growing consensus around which the UK government under Prime Minister Tony Blair pushed of two degrees as being the threshold at which we would uh, not want to go up above. We, we call two, two degrees the, the threshold for dangerous climate change. However, two degrees is not, does not save everybody, particularly the most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable people in those countries are still affected by two degrees, not good enough. And so amongst the vulnerable country grouping, the three groups, we agreed that we would push for one and a half degrees as the long-term temperature goal, even though other countries were not agreeing to that. And in the <coughs> negotiations, we pushed for this. But as I said, negotiators are not final decision makers. Negotiators can only do so much on text and, and details, but when it comes to high-level political decisions, politicians are the decision makers. And even though we had unity amongst the negotiators, we were lacking political leadership on this issue. And at that time, early in that year, there was an election in the Maldives, and the longtime president of the Maldives, President Gayoum, lost the election to a, a radical young uh, journalist come politician <coughs> called Nasheed. He became the president of uh, Maldives. And very soon after he became president, he traveled to London, and he gave a public lecture, much like this, in, a, in the Commonwealth Institute in London, which I attended. And after his lecture, and it was actually almost similar to this kind of a room, maybe a bit bigger, I walked up to him and introduced myself. And I told him that in the climate change negotiations, at the level of the negotiators, we had achieved great unity on the long-term temperature goal of one and a half degrees. But we needed political leadership. And Maldives, was particularly suitable as a country because they belong both to the LDC group and to the EOSIS group, the small island states. So they, by themselves, cover two groups. And they need to reach out to the Africa group to get all three groups. I spoke to him for about five minutes, and then he, he called over his high commissioner, uh, 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 another political, she was a lady who was a political appointee who was in the opposition with him uh, when he was in opposition introduced me to her and told her to follow up with me and get some, get a briefing from me on, on what I was telling her. And sure enough, within a week, she called me, invited me over, and we had a very long conversation. And I explained to her the situation and what I was proposing. And she asked me to write it up, which I did, to give it to her. And she sent it on to President Nasheed. And then within months, he convened a meeting of the leaders of these three groups in the, in the Maldives, in Mali. And he very graciously invited me to go and speak to them, to give a keynote speech uh, to these leaders. He got about 15 countries to be represented. Uh, there was one other head of state, it was the president of Kiribati, President Tom, 
others were all ministers. Uh, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh was invited, but she happened to be visiting Bhutan on a state visit at that time, so she couldn't go herself. She sent two ministers. She sent the Foreign Minister, Dikumani, and she sent the Environment Minister, Hassan Mahmoud. And we spent three days in Bangladesh in a very nice island resort, all together having breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. It was a very cordial atmosphere, discussing what to do, and they came up uh, with two things. Firstly, they formed a group. They called themselves Climate Vulnerable Forum. This was not a new negotiating bloc because they all belong to these, the existing free negotiating blocs. But at the leadership level, heads of state politicians formed this group called the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And they agreed uh, going forward. <clears throat> so then they came to Copenhagen. Um, there were all kinds of things <coughs> extremely cold, freezing, snowing. There were thousands of people. Uh, in the meeting, overflowing, not being able to come in, so they cut the numbers of people allowed in. Uh, it was total chaos. And at the end, heads of state started flying in, unscheduled. Once they knew Obama was going to be there, everybody came, including our prime minister. 100 heads of state with their entourages, walking around the hall. No, not much to do. They give speech to five minutes. What, is they, what else are they going to do? They're hanging around there. And then, in the and, and finally, and that's one of the one of one of the diagnoses afterwards of Copenhagen of one of the reasons why it failed is that the heads of state came at the end before the negotiations had ended. And so they had to do the negotiations themselves. President Obama was sitting with the Chinese president and writing down words and saying, is this okay with you? Presidents should not be negotiating. They should be signing the agreements that have been negotiated by others. And, and that's one of the reasons why it failed. But in that small huddle of heads of state that were left there, I'll, I'll, let me tell you the anecdote. So this is the last evening of the COP. Heads of state are all in town. We get news that um, there's a blizzard approaching Washington, which incidentally is happening right now as well. And uh, Obama has to leave to get into D.C. Uh, before the blizzard arrives or else he won't be able to land his plane. Won't be able to land. So he has to leave. And the, the heads of state are in some room upstairs. We don't know where they are. There's thousands of us in the hall watching television monitors. They're meeting, they're talking. And the next thing we know on the monitor, this is around 8, 9 o'clock p.m. Obama, we see Obama leaving, getting into a helicopter, goes to the airport, gets onto Air Force One. Air Force One takes off. And then live from Air Force One, he's talking to the American journalists on Air Force One. He's talking. He says, we have an agreement. I just signed it. Agreed. The Chinese president, the Indian prime minister, Manmohan Singh, we've all agreed. Uh, it's a very good agreement, etc., etc. Et and we are standing in the hall, what is this agreement? What is this agreement? You know? And then around midnight, the Danish prime minister uh, convened the COP, the, the negotiators, and the agreement was passed around. And he expected to just gavel it through. This was done. The heads of state have agreed it. You know, who's going to open this up? Uh, uh, it's all done. It's just a formality. And then the Venezuelan ambassador, um, uh, a, a woman, very, very perfect, very you know, courageous, very outspoken woman, she started, she took her uh, name uh, piece of uh, wooden name thing on, on the country name, she picked it up and started banging it so hard she cut her hand. And she didn't allow him to continue until she was given the floor. And she said, my president, at that time, was Hugo Chavez. He was in open air, but he wasn't in the small room with the other heads of state. He was not consulted. He has given me instructions. We do not agree to anything that he has not been consulted on. So we do not agree to this. And then country <coughs> after country took the floor. We do not agree. We do not agree. And the poor Danish prime minister was at a complete loss. He didn't know what was going on. didn't know what to do. And uh, we heard later the story that uh, on the UK side, at that time, the, the Prime Minister of the UK was Gordon Brown, and his Environment Minister was a gentleman called Ed Miliband, who later became leader of the Labour Party, and now is no longer leader of the Labour Party. But he was the Environment Minister at that time. And he'd gone to bed. He felt, you know, Gordon Brown was in the, in the room when the disagreements were made. And they felt it's done, so they went to bed. So the, the lead uh, delegate from the UK called up his minister and said, come, the things are falling apart, you have to come back. So he changed, came back took the floor and he asked for a break. He asked the Prime Minister, uh, the Chair of the COP, please let's take a break. Uh, we're not getting anywhere now. We need to discuss this, so let's take an hour break. We'll 
you know, six hour, seven hour break after that. So they broke. And, and in the break, they, one group went to the Danish Prime Minister and said, sir, you're very tired, you should take some rest, you go to bed, you hand over to your deputy to take over. Ban Ki-moon was there. They were all, you know, twisting arms, talking to the other uh, uh, people. President Nasheed was there. Um, and uh, in the end, what happened was, and this is unprecedented, the Copenhagen Agreement that had been agreed by heads of state of all the major countries, but not all countries, just major countries, was rejected. It was not adopted, it was taken note of. The COP took note of the agreement. They said, you know, fine, you guys made an agreement. If somebody wants to sign up to it, they can sign up to it. But we, the UNFCC, 195 countries, so Copenhagen ended in a failure. There was no agreement in Copenhagen. He later on picked up the pieces and a year later in Cancun, did some of the other things. So I won't go into the details of that, but of Copenhagen itself, we had faith. Everybody agreed it was a failure, but everybody has a different explanation or a different villain as to who was responsible for the failure. Americans point at the Chinese, the Chinese point at the Americans, and everybody points at everybody else. But the interesting bit of the story from my story is the following. In that small group of countries, President Nasheed, as of state, President Nasheed managed to stay in there. And he kept on fighting for the long-term goal to be one and a half degrees. And this was the one issue on which the Chinese president and President Obama agreed to not have one and a half degrees. Okay? Neither of them wanted one and a half degrees. They stuck to two. And so poor Nasheed got Overruled, he just could not fight them. But what he did, and he did this very cleverly, he inserted into the Copenhagen Agreement the last paragraph of the Copenhagen Agreement that we will review the long term temperature goal between 2013 and 2015. So even though we adopt two degrees now, this is open to a review, and we will review it later. This is 2009. A few years from now, five years from now, 2015, we'll review this. We planted a little a little hand, silent hand. Now, during that period in the UNFCC process, there has been a review. It's called the Structured Expert Dialogue between 2013 and 2015. The UNFCC invited scientists from the IPCC to examine this question of the long term goal and, in particular, look at what is the difference between a temperature rise of 2 degrees and a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees. And in June of 2015, they produced a report. It's on the UNFCC website and I'll summarize it for you. The summary of their report was the following. They said with 2 degree temperature rise, if we can keep the temperature rise below 2 degrees, we will effectively be able to protect most countries, most people, most ecosystems. If we want to protect all, then the temperature goal needs to be up one and a half degrees. Between that one and a half and two, the half degree is critical not for the rich, but for the poorest people, the most vulnerable. They are the ones who will suffer. And this report was actually not adopted in the UNFCC at the pre Paris meeting when it was presented. And it then went to Paris. And this was the adoption of this report was the technical way of revisiting the temperature goal of two degrees. Do we, have, do we accept the report or don't accept the report? And until the very last minute, countries tried to stop acceptance and the one left standing at the very end, and I'll come to that in a minute, but I'll, I'll tell you who it is, is Saudi Arabia. They stopped, they would not allow the adoption of the report. But anyway, so, the, so technically, the negotiating issue was adoption of the structured expert dialogue on the temperature, long term temperature goal. Should we accept it? Not accept it. If we accept it, then one and a half degrees needs to be adopted as the temperature goal. So let me shift to the Climate Vulnerable Forum and say what happened after the Maldives meeting. After the meeting in Maldives, <coughs> President Tom of Kiribati took over the meeting. So the, the forum continued. Uh, President Tom of Kiribati became the president of it. He held the meeting in Kiribati. After him, it became, it came to Bangladesh. President <coughs> Prasina was the third leader of the group. She had a big meeting in Dhaka and Sharangal in 2013. 
Uh, by that time, the forum num members had increased, so about 20 or 30 countries who were joining. Um, after Bangladesh, it went to President Castro of uh, Costa Rica, and after Costa Rica, it went to the Philippines. So 2015, going into Paris, it was under the chairmanship of the presidency of President Aquino of the Philippines. And what the Philippines did was, a few weeks before um, the, the Paris meeting, they invited uh, high-level officials from the Climate Development Forum to the Philippines for a three-day planning session. And the way the Climate Development Forum itself operates, functions, <coughs> it functions on a troika system, which means that the current president, the sitting president, along with the two previous presidents, the one immediately before him or her, and the one <coughs> before that, the three countries together are the governing body, the three talk to each other, organize, say what they want to do, and then invite others and bring them on board. So Philippines, Costa Rica, and Bangladesh are the track at the moment, up till now. Next year, it goes to Ethiopia. We now we know who it's going to go to. Uh, the Philippines will hand over to Ethiopia. After that, Bangladesh is no longer part of the track. It has become Ethiopia, Philippines, and Costa Rica. So in this Troika-led uh, meeting in Philippines, Bangladesh was represented at a very high level by W, because I said uh, originally there were two ministries involved, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Environment, so they, they've always been together on this, and in fact, it's been led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, when the meeting was held in Ankara, it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that led on it, and that's the sector of Ankara that's very much involved. Um, and in the uh, Manila meeting, Bangladesh was represented by high officials from Industry. And what happened in Manila were two things. The <clears throat> Paris relevant one was we reiterated our uh, strategy for asking for the one and a half degree goal, and that we would now raise the ante in terms of wanting this and asking for it, and in fact telling the French and everybody else that this was our sin qua non for a Paris agreement. If we don't get it, then we don't agree to anything in Paris. We need to have this. And so we mobilized these 100 countries. Going forward, there was a, a lot of interest from civil society, and in particular, one of the big international NGOs, Care International, uh, mobilized civil society. They had a website for us on, in which countries that were joining the one and a half degree countries would be added up and we have we go 100 countries and 101 and 102 and 103. And there was a, a big public campaign with a hand signal, which I'll show you. So the hand signal was this. One, a circle, and five. 1.5. But everybody around the world, if you go on the website, you'll find hundreds of photographs of people standing like this. 1.5 to survive. Right. This was the slogan and the photograph. And, and the hand signal. And thousands of people. And there's a hand signal on the last day of the Manila meeting. Um, we were all uh, taken to the Malacanian Palace of the President, uh, where the, the, the meeting was finalized. And before going, we were all given a, a very nice uh, uh, Filipino shirt, you know, what do you call it, the baron, uh, to wear. So we're all wearing barons, and we're all standing in big photographs all of us with the hand signal. So we launched this campaign, big campaign, in Manila, and took it to Paris. In Paris, on the first day, so one of the things that, that the French learned from the mistakes of the Danes, was don't bring the heads of state in the end. They only call, call scares. Bring them in the beginning. Let them make a big speech and tell them to go home. And let negotiators negotiate. So in Paris, the heads of state were invited on day one, the 30th of November. And then they were asked to go. And then we continued for two weeks for negotiating the deal, and we got it on the 12th of December. And so on the 30th of November, we had uh, Obama, we had heads of state, we had 100 plus heads of state, our head of state uh, the government, Shina uh, Sinha didn't go, we by our Minister for Environment. And on the 30th of November, there were many different speeches, uh, meetings. <coughs> the Climate Vulnerable Forum held a big meeting where a number of new members joined. So the, the numbers went up to about 70 or 80. Ethiopia became endorsed as a new chair. And under the presidency, under President Aquino, who chaired that meeting, um, and, and I was uh, given the privilege of moderating that discussion, we had the Minister for Costa Rica, the Minister for Bangladesh speak, and the President of the Philippines speak, 
and he declared the one and a half degree uh, temperature goal. So we're starting today is the 30th of November. We have two more weeks of negotiation. We want one and a half degrees. This is our one big demand, and we want other countries to support our demand. And then immediately after the meeting, there was big civil uh, support from civil society, from the media, on the one and a half degree. Over the next came around to uh, agreeing to us, and, and I'll, I'll share uh, my view of how how and why that happened. So the big big pushback that we had on the one and a half degree was from both the large developed countries, US, Europe, as well as the upcoming developing countries, China, India, etc., <coughs> was that it's impractical. It's just too difficult to do. Okay, so guys, you know, stop asking for this because it's too difficult for us to deliver. But our argument was it may be difficult, but it's not impossible. And as long as it's not impossible, it's the right thing to do. And in Paris, the leaders of the world need to give a signal that is, including everybody on the planet, is going to be protected. And if they agree to a two degree <coughs> temperature goal, they are explicitly saying to the poorest people, we cannot protect you. We will protect ourselves, but sorry guys, you are on your own. We are not going to protect because it's too difficult for us to reduce our emissions, to do all that's necessary. And, and that was a very bad message, particularly for the democracies, to say out loud. So they said it behind closed doors to us. It's very difficult, you know, please don't push this. But when they're outside in front of the camera and their own newsmen were asking them, why don't you agree with the vulnerable country demand one and a half degrees? They can't say, it's too difficult, we don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. Okay? They told us, they can't do it. What they were saying was, we won't do it. We can, but we won't. Okay? And they were not able to say that in public to the cameras. And so one after one, including the United States, they started saying, OK, one and a half degrees, one and a half degrees. And at one point, the Indian minister, in fact, made a joke about this. He said, why one and a half? Why not one degree? Facetious joke that he made. And we went to the Indian NGOs and we told them, go tell your minister he's insulting us. Shouldn't do that. He's pissing off 100 countries who are asking for one and a half degrees. So this is not trivial matter. And we need to apologize. He said, I didn't mean to. So we pushed them. We made them. One by one, they had to come and agree with the one and a half degree temperature rise. And as I said, until the very end, country after country, the numbers kept coming on our side and, and dwindling on the other side until Saudi Arabia was left all alone. Saudi Arabia to the very bitter end of those countries. Because, this is my opinion, they don't care about public opinion. They're a kingdom, they don't care. People like wrong, they just have their own interests and they stick to their own interests. And in the end, in the last minutes of the meeting in Paris, it took a phone call from President Hollande to the king of Saudi Arabia to tell him, to tell your negotiator to change his Everybody else is agreed, and we don't want to agree. The Paris Reluctantly, we took their objection, and we had the agreement on one and a half degrees. Now, one and a half degrees is not wanted. For two weeks, in diplomatic travel, it was a major victory for the vulnerable country. Of to get uh, uh, the right of one and a half degrees two weeks ago. Um, and uh, let's end the story with a little bit more about the forum and its evolution. One of the um, evolutions of the forum itself over time has been that it is no longer just a one. There's been a lot of discussion about countries working together, cooperating, South-South policy. Uh, the, the president of Benito Benino Aquino and his finance minister initiative 
of the finance at the time of the IMF World Bank. And then when we were in the Philippines, the Philippines announced a South-South Center on Climate Information. They have a very, very good MET department that has a lot of uh, capacity, do a lot of warnings because they're you know, typhoon uh, uh, event in a vulnerable country. So they declared uh, their uh, MET department into a South-South Center on uh, Climate Information. And uh, at the moment, I'm trying to get the Bangladesh government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of uh, uh, Environment to Proposed that Bangladesh also has a South South Center on adaptation technology because there's a lot of adaptation experience in Bangladesh, which we can share with other countries. So I haven't convinced the government yet, but I'm hoping that they uh, agree to do this. So, what is happening with the Climate Vulnerable Forum in practice, in between the COPs, is we are now looking to tackle climate change in reality on the ground, share our experience with each other, and help each other. So that the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the, climate, the vulnerable countries, become actually leaders in tackling climate change. By example, doing things, not waiting for the rest of the world to come to the rescue, uh, but doing things, tackling climate change, and, and sharing that with everybody else. So that's the end of my story. Let me stop there, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, if you can identify yourself. I'm Theo Bailey. I, I go to support the American International. Um, do you believe that their goal will be reached, that uh, the climate change will be reduced to less, 1.5 degrees Celsius or less in your prediction? If so, why? It's a tough question. Um, internal optimism. So the Paris Agreement itself is not the, uh, the best agreement. If you compare it to what we need to do, it's totally inadequate. If you compare it to what we achieved in getting 200 countries to agree to do something together, which we failed to do <coughs> before then. It's a major achievement. And so what we, the major achievement is every country has agreed to go forward. Every country has put forward a, a plan to do things. If you add up all the plans, then at the moment we're headed for about three and a half degrees to four degrees, business as usual, if we don't do anything. If all these countries implement the plans that they put forward, we bring that down to 2.7 degrees. Not good enough, not even two degrees. But what we have also agreed is that we'll ratchet up. Every five years, we will review and ratchet up and hopefully improve on and do better so that it becomes increasingly possible to do more and more. So my answer is that if there's political will and we really put ourselves into it, then it's possible to do. And we are headed in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go. The reason why the one and a half is important is that that gives us, the vulnerable countries, a yardstick or a whip to measure everybody's performance. And we can say it's not good enough. What you're doing isn't good enough. Do better. Let's all do better. And that's what it is. It's a strategic piece of tool that we, the vulnerable countries, now have to use for China, for India, for the United States, for Europe, for Japan, and for us. Everybody needs to be doing more. And that's really the, the strategic win that we have. You know, a number one and a half, what is it? Someone to change the world, but it gives us a means of keeping the pressure on uh, countries, all countries, to do things. So, whether we reach it or not is a matter of uh, you know whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. If you're a pessimist, then it's an unlikely. But I'm an optimist, so I think we can. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. I'm Ravi Um Thank you for your presentation. You see, the the, the reason why most countries are uh, fresh. Uh, is to uh, one and a half percent is because of it and therefore the business the big businesses or small business or business interests of the country need to engage in this whole discussion i don't <coughs> i didn't hear from you any engagement of the business community anywhere because the politicians and the uh, you know and the, 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 the people who are doing research on this 
but uh, there was no engagement of the business communities in these countries. Well, there was. I didn't mention it. So let me let me tell you what happened. So the business community has been engaged in this issue from the very beginning. Uh, when I say business, there's business and there's business. Um, the main business is the fossil fuel industry. Yes. Companies like Exxon, Shell, BP. These companies have very, very strong internal scientific capacity. They've been looking at this issue for decades. Um, there's a recent case going on against Exxon that they knew climate change was real and they then had a um, Other companies from day zero to stop action. Okay? They have a strategy. Their strategy was their business model would be affected if we were to not stop, stop using fossil fuels and they didn't want that. So the business model was prevent any kind of an agreement. And that's why Saudi Arabia is such a spoiler. Saudi Arabia, I'll give you the example of Saudi Arabia. Almost every country in, in the negotiations is represented in the UN Friendly Convention by either ministries of environment, like that, or sometimes Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like the Chinese, the Brazilians, sometimes even Ministry of Planning. Saudi Arabia is unique in that it is represented in the Friendly Convention on Climate Negotiations by the Ministry of Petroleum from day zero. And the Ministry of Petroleum negotiators who come, there's a number of them, very, very uh, good negotiators, extremely well uh, uh, read and, and prepared. They are seconded by the oil company Aramco, full time, to the Saudi Ministry of Petroleum, whose day job, day in, day out, for 12 months, not just for the cops, is to be negotiators on climate change. And their strategy in the Conference of Parties is to hold things up. And they are extremely skilled negotiators. The way they do this normally is that anybody who raises, any country that raises some kind of an objection on anything, they will immediately support that country and say, that's a very important point. We must spend the next three days talking about it, okay? <laughs> so that we don't have an agreement. And they've done this, you know, they have, they have, on an occasion in the UNFCC, held up a five day long meeting for two whole days, objecting to the agenda of the meeting. This agenda is not right. Item 3 and item 4 should be the other way around. For two days, we all sat there waiting for an agreement. So they're extremely skilled. This is the oil oil lobby, oil companies. They, are, they, they, they used to be very effective. They're now decreasing in their effectiveness. We now have a new business, the clean energy business. They're not as big and not as powerful as the oil companies, but they're getting numerous and they're getting collected. And they're so in fact, the US um, from the United States of America there used to be one business group that came, that was the oil company lobbies. Now there are two business groups. There's a sustainable development business group and an oil business group. The oil businesses, they take the Hilton Hotel, they book the whole damn Hilton, they both have meetings in the Hilton all day long. And the, the small businesses have a smaller hotel and they, they stay there, but they both lobby. And they two sides of the lobby now. So there is a business case for taking action and a business case for not taking action. The not taking action are the oil companies and the taking action are new businesses, clean energy businesses, who are beginning to thrive and, and get better and hopefully over time uh, will be... Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, just, I was just thinking that perhaps there should be more dialogue in the, the business world. We don't hear... Oh yeah, uh, well, I mean, the, the two things. What do you mean by dialogue? Yeah, between, between the, between they, are, they, they have Obama's ear. They have George Bush's ear. You know, they were in Dick Cheney's inside his mind. Dick know, Cheney was making them on this basis. So they don't have to come to the UNFCC because Dick Cheney is their man. You know, they bought senators. The, the, the deniers in the U.S. Senate are in the pockets of the oil lobby. The individual senators actually don't believe what they say. They know climate change is real, but they have to say it's not real because they get money from the oil companies. Okay? They are bought, absolutely bought. There's no question about it. And so, you know, they, they can lobby with the government. That's how they lobby. They don't have to come to the UNFCC and, you know, do a song and dance because they have politicians who will do their business. So how do you intend to win? We have one. We have Obama won. Obama took them on. So I'll give you a big difference between what happened in, in Paris and what happened in Copenhagen and why. It's the same Obama. Obama came to Copenhagen and he came to Paris. In Paris we won in Copenhagen we lost. In the first term of uh, President Obama, he did not take climate change seriously. He was invested his political capital in the healthcare field, in, in Obamacare. Um, he came to Copenhagen he tried, but it didn't work. 
In the second term was very, very different. Several things were different. Firstly, he chose to take on climate change. And if you look at Obama's speeches in the last uh, uh, year or so, he has been taking on the Obamas on climate change, the senators, the, the Republicans. He is fighting. He's taking, and he understands it. He explains it very well. He's got it. He has some very, very senior uh, negotiators and scientists in his team, Nobel Prize winning scientists. He gets the science. There's no question about it. Another big difference between Obama 1 and Obama 2 was that under Obama 1, the Secretary of State was Hillary Clinton, who is now a professional in the Democratic Party. She didn't care about that. She wasn't going to take that much. In Obama 2, with Senator Kerry coming in as Secretary of State, Senator Kerry has been following this issue for a very long time. He's extremely knowledgeable. He had a bill in Congress with John McCain, which didn't get through in the end. He was in Kyoto, he went into the negotiations. He was with Al Gore in Kyoto at the negotiation. He follows this very, very closely. And so the moment he became Secretary of State, he took charge of the climate change portfolio. He said, I'm in charge of this. Everything came to Secretary of State. He took over. He opened the secret backdoor channel with China, and they negotiated a deal. So you recall at some point in the last year, President Obama went to China, and they announced a joint program, joint climate change. China and America are going to work together. This was secretly in the because that was the failure of Copenhagen. They were fighting each other. In, in Paris, they came together. Not enough, but they worked together. And he did that. So Kerry uh, in in state and Obama as president and their uh, you know the, the uh, Secretary of Energy Muniz who's an extremely he's a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Okay, so these guys know their stuff. And, and he knew the other difference between Obama one and Obama two. Obama one, he still wanted Congress to come on board, so he was trying to get Congress. Obama two, he's given up on Congress. Is that Congress not going to? To anything he does, so he's going to have to ignore them and do whatever he can. So he uses the power of the presidency, the power of the executive, the power of the federal government, and he's been doing that. He's been using, using the EPA, the Environment Protection Agency, to clamp down on coal-fired power plants in the U.S. Big, big step. You know, they have to bring down their emissions to because CO2 has been declared by the Supreme Court a pollutant. EPA is supposed to reduce pollution. So they are making the coal-fired power plants in America reduce their emissions by executive order. The, the, they're fighting back. The, you know, all the Republican candidates for president say they're going to roll back all of these things. I think Obama is going to do. In fact, interestingly, in Paris, there were Republican senators who flew all the way to Paris to tell us, the rest of the world, don't negotiate with our president. He has no authority to agree to anything. And even if he agrees to anything, as soon as we're in the White House, we're going to change it all and reverse it. So don't make any agreement with him. So it was the weirdest thing to have parliamentarians from a country come and tell us to stop negotiating with their leader. Obviously, we didn't listen to them, but that's what they said. Dr. Wayne, yeah. thank you. Thank you. A passing remark on Obama, a continuation of what you just said. Uh, I think Obama knows that he does not have to seek a new election. That's right. I think that made the difference between Obama one and that's obvious. But I'd like to highlight two, two points, two, two issues you mentioned. The first is the 1.5 degrees. I think uh, we need to understand that this 1.5 degrees is, is at a higher level compared to pre-industrial uh, state as a group. So I think that this one. You're right. That's the benchmark. This is uh, pre-industrial. This is number one. Secondly, it's also very important that when all these negotiations really caught on foot about started about 40 years ago and then really got caught on foot about 25 years ago. Uh, people were initially talking about four degrees. I, I mentioned this because four degrees has a tremendous consequence in one direction. So I, I would like to highlight the two things. The four degrees rise at that point in time when people were discussing four would have implied that uh, roughly one fourth of Bangladesh would have gone underwater with the rise of four degrees. And uh, roughly one third of our agricultural production getting destroyed. But my question to you is how do you translate? I mean, coming down from four to two and then eventually, if you can, uh, 1.5. Uh, I, I, I think 1.5 has not fully been adopted as such. But uh, 
Yeah, aspirational. Yes. So, uh, what what would be the Bangladesh scenario? We, we hopefully can live it to one point five years. Can you quantitate it? See, that that will need another lecture. So <laughs> perhaps they'll invite me back to do that. Uh, but in short, um, Bangladesh is still extremely vulnerable. So one one of the things that Paris was not about, and Paris have not dealt with, is the next twenty years. The next twenty years or thirty years even is locked in. No agreement in Paris, good, bad. Even if we had an even more ambitious agreement in Paris, does anything to the world for the next twenty years? The, the Greenhouse gases are already in the atmosphere, and they're going to uh, take up the sun's uh, energy, and we will have temperature rise, and we'll have climatic changes for the next 20 years. What we are talking about doing is avoiding catastrophic changes on a 50 to 100 year time scale. Hopefully, we can prevent that, but we cannot prevent whatever whatever's going to happen for the next 20 years. And so, Bangladesh is locked into a certain amount of those kinds of impacts. Exactly how much we don't know. But we need to get better at estimating them and get better at dealing with them. And in fact, um, uh, if, I can, if I can cite out of context a, a meeting that I was invited to uh, uh, recently, a, a policy breakfast with some politicians from different parties, I made a suggestion that climate change is one issue that hopefully all political parties in Bangladesh can come together on and maybe use this as a means of having a long-term strategy where there are no political differences between DNC and our move on climate change. At the moment in the negotiations, it's very true. You know, when we had change of leadership, when we had Khaled Azia as prime minister, when we had Hasina uh, as prime minister, Bangladesh's stance has been the same. Bangladesh negotiations by the government and the NGOs that go to the negotiations, we have a common agenda. We work very closely together. So this is an area where on one on one level we can have political unity and then work out what we need to do. It's still a big problem for Bangladesh, so there's no question about that, which we will have to tackle. Uh, but that's the story for another. First of all, thank you so much for taking us behind the scenes because I had known it was agreed on, but I never knew the drama that went on with it and the intense, courageous organizing that needed to happen to, to achieve this. Um, but when you say it's aspirational, what I want to uh, emphasize is what that means is this, that no required actions have been outlined in the no mandatory levels of emissions by countries have been agreed. The second is something that I, I believe that the agreement doesn't insist on actual emissions. What it says is that uh, countries and corporations will be allowed to continue carbon pollution, uh, but they will be allowed to claim reductions. Uh, by carbon trading schemes. And I was wondering if you could, since I have you here in front of me, if you could say something about trading sure. schemes and what does that mean, this horrible offset thing? Sure. So let me uh, try and address that without getting too much into the weeds. So one of the big differences between the older paradigm and the new paradigm that we have in Paris was that in the older paradigm, and Kyoto is a very good example of this, the Kyoto Protocol, was a very top-down, legally binding mess. <coughs> All countries sign up and then they have to do something. If they don't do something, we hit them on the head and, and come in and, and police them. That paradigm simply did not work. And so we have a new paradigm in Paris, which has its weaknesses, but it also has its advantages. The advantage of the Paris paradigm is every country went to Paris with a plan, a pledge to do something to reduce their emissions. Bangladesh went with one. So I'll tell you what the Bangladesh plan was. Bangladesh plan was over the next uh, 15, 20 years by 2030, we can reduce on our own our emissions from a business as usual trajectory, not from where they are today, but where they are today. We can bring them down by 5% on our own. We'll do that. We'll make that investment. But if we get technology and money, we can bring it down even further. We can bring it down to 15%. And so all the plans, the developed countries have given their plans, the developing countries have given their plans, the developing country plans are this two-track plan. This is how much we can do on our own. But if we get finance and technology, then we can do more. And so now we need to ratchet up countries to fulfill their pledges and do more than their pledges. And so it's now it's a, it's, it, it's an honor system. They've made pledges to keep their pledges. We're not 
people to make them comply. There's no compliance system like that. It's all soft law. So right now, we are using the honor system where countries make a pledge, we believe their pledge. We believe they will do it. And every year, we're going to review it. So every five years, we'll see if countries are doing it or not doing it, can do more. It's name and shame. Countries don't do it, we'll shame them. Countries are doing that, we praise them. And hopefully that will ratchet up uh, actions. And the trading scheme is now redundant. We, that was a Kyoto mechanism. In the, in the uh, new mechanism in the Paris, there's no more trading. Everybody has to do their own. You can't, you can't buy uh, offsets from somebody else and, and claim it has. You have to do work at home. Only the stuff you do at home counts, mm -hmm. uh, which is good. In my view, because that, that trading scheme was subject to a lot of you know, mismanagement and, and potential corruption. So my name is Kazuri, so I'm a bit more than that. So actually, you know, just answered that uh, question I was thinking about. But uh, what I am also thinking, I want to congratulate you, sir. Uh, because I have participated in uh, simulations uh, last year in Germany. And I know uh, the country position. All the countries uh, uh, stand beside their, uh, their negotiation position. And I know, I know that uh, business interests, not only of Saudi Arabia, U.S., Canada, even Japan, European Union, everybody, everywhere they have pressure from their stakeholders, from the business community, and I, the recruiters or the politicians, they want uh, to, to, to be set on their place, but they know they cannot uh, convince their stakeholders that home. So that's why they cannot take a position. But uh, that way, you have contributed. Uh, so you said that uh, uh, the uh, president uh, Seated uh, this on one five degree, but I think it's you who initiated this. With the, you, you have you made the ambassador, then you uh, submitted a proposal, and that whole thing has uh, has created this current uh, climate vulnerable forum, and finally we have achieved this. So uh, globally, uh, actually, I, I am very proud that uh, you are actually initiating this process, and we have achieved this, and you have also clarified this how we will achieve it. Uh, because if, the, if it is not legally binding, then how we can achieve it? But states are actually independent. We cannot impose on the state without attacking states. So it, uh, we have to be on that. So actually, my question is answered already. Thank you very much. I, I, I take a little bit of credit, but not a lot. It was done by the leader who took it up and fought the fight. I was an advisor. Yes. Now, your question to your debate now really was that some say, that uh, the alarm raised about the vulnerability of Bangladesh due to climate change is over exaggerated. Arguing that the addition of land due to silt and sediment deposit <coughs> in those areas of the country is taking place at a subsidy of some uh, about equal pace of the subsist subsidence that might occur by sea level rise or even. So the, the coastal area of Bangladesh is an extremely dynamic coast. So Bangladesh exists because of the Himalaya started flowing this was under the sea for millennia and we have Bangladesh. This land. Uh, the coast is very dynamic. There's accretion in some parts and the, and the ocean in other parts. On balance, it's not quite clear, but on balance it may well be Net, in net terms, there is accretion taking place in some parts and erosion in other parts. Even if that's true, we're not quite sure, it's not easy to tell. There is a big difference between land accreting and land erosion. The accreting land gives a very, very soil. It's mainly sand. It's not really cultivable for a long time. The forest department has to go and put in you know, kiora, tara, the salt tolerant varieties of trees, they stabilize it some organic content in the soil. It takes about five to ten years before accreted land becomes suitable for agriculture. Erosion, on the other hand, is taking place in places where people are doing high-level agriculture, even homesteads going into the sea. Um, and so the erosion, even if the net land is zero, loss is zero, the quality of that land makes a huge difference. We lose good quality land and we gain to gain good quality, to replace it, takes many, many years. And so, on the whole, it's a ne negative, even though there might be positive uh, accretion going on in some parts of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, the government is actually looking at how can we accelerate innovation. There are schemes to try and do that. The Netherlands has you know, built itself on accelerating accretion of land within the whole race. We can do that in some places. We've done a little bit of it, but we, we cannot replicate what the Netherlands has done. The scale of investment required for that is in the tens of millions of dollars. They can afford it. You mentioned that Bangladesh is good at adapting to climate change. How? How is it good? So I'll give you one um, example. Um, as you know, we're we are already a flood-prone and a cyclone-prone country, with or without climate change. It's, and that's occurred here. Um, and I'll give you an example which isn't a climate change example, but it's an adaptation example. So you know that we had a um, massive cyclone in 71, we now call it the whole up, uh, cyclone that killed hundreds of thousands of lives, 300,000. Then we had the 91 cyclone that killed in the meantime, since then, we've had a massive campaign of building cyclone shelters, uh, developing early warning systems to track the cyclones, giving early warning warnings by Red Cross and Red Crescent and volunteers going out, teaching children. We have built a fairly robust and, and one of the best early warning for cyclone systems in the world. And in the last 10 years, we had two big cyclones, Highland and Sigurd. Uh, they were on the same magnitude in physical terms with the two other uh, cyclones. But the, the death rate came down significantly, just a few thousand in both cases. And most of them were fishermen who were out at sea who didn't get back in time. We successfully warned and moved two million people. We got the warning, they moved to the shelters. Now, there was a lot of damage. Crops were damaged, roads were damaged, but life loss was brought down. Significant orders of magnitude, put by hundreds of thousands, put by two thousand. And in the same time, between these two cyclones, we had nerves. Nargis, Cyclone Nargis came up the Bay of Bengal up north, heading for us. And then it veered east, hit Myanmar. 100,000 people plus died in Myanmar. So they're not any more richer, better than us, or poorer than us. <coughs> but they were not prepared. So that's what preparation and adaptation can do. It can bring the death rate down, and Bangladesh is a very good example of having successfully done that. It doesn't stop the cyclone. We still have a cyclone. It still has a lot of damage. But death rate. Major achievement. Yes, one last question. Yeah, I'm interested to know about. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Ms. Mosca, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm interested to know about your experience in Bangladesh and Good question. So the, um, the question is, is there a year that we have agreed to where we will peak the emissions and then after that we'll come down? But obviously the earlier we do that, the better, the later we do it, the worse for us. Um, and, and the answer is we don't have a peak uh, But we have in the, in the nationally determined uh, contributions that the country plan, plan, plans that they have, uh, countries are doing, countries are themselves trying to figure out what is our what, what year would we, we go up for a while, but at some point we have to steady and then over time we need to come down. And so every country needs to make their own decision according to their own circumstances, how they can do that, but eventually come down. See, so that now is the trajectory. We, have, we can go up for a while, then we have to stop, and then we have to come down. Um, and that's a matter of internal arrangements, you know, the balance of emission, fossil fuel dependent energy use in the country, how much hydro they have, how much nuclear they have, how much uh, solar and, and uh, 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 clean energy they have. And on that front, interestingly, Bangladesh is another very good example. You know, Bangladesh has the fastest growing solar home systems in the world. For over 40 million households have bought these systems. And, it's a, it's a, and they're selling them about 50,000 a month right now. It's a public private partnership. The companies are selling them to the households and the households are buying them. And, and uh, the innovation is a Financial and a technical innovation. Financial is a model for providing low interest loans so households can buy the unit, and then which is an expensive thing to buy, and then pay, pay back on a weekly basis. And interestingly, the weekly repayment of the loan, they take a loan to buy the unit and pay back the loan in weekly installments, is actually cheaper than the kerosene that it replaces. So they used to spend more on kerosene, they now spend less if they have a solar unit. 
And then the second uh, problem that we had, because we've been putting in solar panels for decades in Bangladesh, it's a graveyard. Of, we put it in, works for a while, doesn't work after a while, nobody can fix it, and, and people who put it in are gone. But in this case, what they've done is these companies that sell also give after-sales service. So if something goes wrong, you call them up, everybody has a mobile phone now, they come, if they can fix it, they fix it, if they can't fix it, they replace it. So you now have reliability of supply, so the, the buyers are willing to buy. And the last point to make on that is there have been studies on why, why households, relatively poor, not the poorest of the poor, but relatively poor households, buy these units. And the biggest motivating factor is children's education. The kids tell their parents, how do you expect me to do my homework after dark? You know, next door they have a light. I have a little kerosene lamp. I can't study with this. So the parents go and buy a, a unit and they put in a light and then the kids can study. Okay, yes, let's take one last one. Thank you, sir, for giving us a very interesting information which would not be possible to get unless you have this kind of public lecture for us. My question is just to have some clarification about the financial opportunities that that was the expectation from the different agencies two different process like NAMA, CDF and GRED process. What is the uh, position now after passing the, these processes? So and one of the things that has, of, yes, one of, one of the things that has been agreed, in fact this was an agreement pre-Paris, in Paris it was uh, reiterated and, and made more solid, was that the rich countries offered to uh, provide up to 100 billion dollars a year starting in 2020, to developing countries to tackle climate change to, on, on forestry, on mitigation, and on adaptation. In Paris, that has been reiterated. In fact, in Paris, it's been agreed that will be a floor, not a ceiling. They start with 100 billion and they ratchet it up. One of the things that our, our negotiators have been pushing for, the vulnerable countries have been pushing for, was a demand that that 100 billion should be split 50-50 between adaptation and mitigation. The mitigation can go to the large developing countries like China and India to bring down their emissions, but the adaptation money should come to the most vulnerable countries like Bangladesh. Um, at the moment, the, the current flow of funding uh, that is in the order of 50 billion plus, to, to ratchet up to 100 billion by 2020, uh, is very skewed. It's 84% mitigation and only 16% adaptation. And that's not fair or correct, and we fought that. So we, we made a big and cry about the balance of funding. And that has not been agreed. So 50% uh, will be on adaptation. And uh, the other thing that has been agreed is that the mechanism for delivery is a new fund called the Green Climate Fund, which has been set up. It has a board of directors and secretariat in Korea. Bangladesh actually has a seat on the board. Uh, our Secretary of the Environment is the member. Of that. Through that Green Climate Fund, countries can apply for funding and get funding. The Green Climate Fund had its uh, board meeting just before the Paris uh, meeting, and for the first time approved eight projects. So the first five climate projects have been approved. Bangladesh was one of them. So Bangladesh, the local government engineering department has a project, $40 million project, to incorporate climate change in their um, construction projects that they do. They're building nightmares and sweet states and, and small roads around the country. They will now incorporate climate change in the planning, basically make them more robust with the impacts of so Bangladesh is beginning to get some funding from uh, the international arena, and hopefully uh, they'll get more in the future. So more. Thank you very much for your brilliant lecture. We learned a lot, and it's a very interesting story. That's the, we'd like you to tell the story to everyone, right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my sister keeps telling me to take a sabbatical and write a book. Yeah. Yeah. Keep promising it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. My brother Salandian and I want to express our deep appreciation to Dr. Huck, our own beloved Salim, not only for sharing this unique uh, behind the scenes story, but we also want to acknowledge you personally for all the energy and time that you have put into the most critical issue of our times. And we also want to thank all of you for being present at the second lecture of the Hassan Imam lecture series, uh, a series that we have set up in honor of our father, Mr. Hassan Imam, who taught us so much about balance and fairness. Um, this lecture series is a contribution towards his legacy 
because had he still been here, I believe firmly that he would have been a leader in exposing the wounds of inequality and injustice in the world today. Uh, and in this precarious time we live in, I think he would have himself convened discussions such as this because um, I think it's a moment when we need to guide ourselves to make collective decisions that are the right ones because the entire future generations are going to depend on what we decide today. So I want to thank you all for also joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, please join us for some refreshments.